today, and I just want to, the title of my talk is a little different from probably the flyers, and I wanted to incorporate some of my international work as well as my local community work. So the title is Working for Working Within Four Communities to Understand Systemic Influences on Adolescent Sexual Risk and Resilience. So we're talking I'll be talking about data from the US and South Africa. So this is just a general flow for the presentation. I'll just kind of introduce my research interests, talk a little bit about some HIV prevention work um, and specifically some work in rural North Carolina as well as some HIV intervention work, and I have a couple ongoing studies in South Africa and then future directions. So broadly, I'm interested in adolescent health. So I'm a clinical psychologist by training, and a lot of my work incorporates public health sciences. So I put stars next to the topics that I'd like to cover during this presentation. So I'll talk about HIV prevention, um, HIV treatment, retention, and adherence, and syndemics, a little bit about syndemics. But I'm also interested in positive youth development programs and chronic disease management, all within the adolescent framework. So let's talk a little bit about adolescents. So generally, when we talk about adolescents, we're talking about youth between the ages of 10 and 19, although sometimes you might see 13 to 24. It just kind of depends on your reference. Um, and they make, about, they make up about 20% of the world's population, and 85% of them live in developing countries. So there's been a, glow, a growing recognition among policymakers that adolescents have special health-related vulnerabilities. So previously, we kind of treated adolescents, they're either children or adults. And this is often the case in some developing countries as well, where the recognition of adolescents as a separate or distinct developmental stage is not quite there. So generally, we think of adolescents as being pretty healthy. So, but the major causes of morbidity and mortality within this group tend to be suicide, road accidents, drug use, and issues related to sexual and reproductive ill health. So my, the reason I decided to focus on adolescents during graduate school um, and decided to focus specifically on adolescent and child psychology because I really see them as a gateway of health. So they're, they're, I think they're a really great group to intervene with. They're mature enough to kind of understand some of the concepts that I was teaching when I was working with them clinically, but also pliable enough to make changes early on. Not to say adults are not, but adolescents, I really think that they're just at a great point in development where they can learn different tasks and you're able to make significant changes early on. So sexually transmitted infections among adolescents in the U.S. So 15 to 24 years of age, they report the highest rates of STIs and up to 60% of new infections and half of all people living with HIV globally are in this age group. So they are a really key population. We're really starting to get more attention, focus on adolescent health, especially adolescent HIV treatment um, within this age group. So in 2011, 73% of all rural AIDS cases among adults and adolescents in the U.S. were reported from the South. So we're living in a, an area that's a key concern in terms of controlling STIs, especially HIV. So we've, there have been a number of things that we've, what, another of reasons that we've attributed to this um, STI infection, especially in the South. So lack of sex education. So I learned that during my postdoc when I was here a few years ago, that in North Carolina, sex education is really kind of dependent upon district. So it's not mandatory for, for teachers to teach youth about condom use. And when in the community that we work in specifically, the youth will tell us, well, if we ask our teacher, our health teacher, about how to use condoms, they divert us to say, well, how could you prevent having sex in the first place? Now, think about this as an adolescent. Now, if you tell them they can't do something, that doesn't mean that they're not going to do it. That means that you're kind of sending, especially without having sex education, you're sending them out unarmed. Um, and in rural North Carolina, they had been experiencing a, a relative decrease in teen pregnancy rates 
over 10 years, and I'll talk more about North Carolina specifically a little later on. But in recent years, it's starting to spike again with teen pregnancy rates are now going up. So lack of or inconsistent condom use, I can't tell you how many of the youth we talked to that said, yes, I use condoms, but not all the time. Um, sexual coercion or violence, sex work, issues related to biological sex, but one of my main interests has to do with the density of sexual networks. So if you're more, like, you're more likely to have people in your network that have STIs or HIV, especially when you're in isolated communities, you're more likely to be exposed to it. So I started during graduate school, I wanted to impact this area somehow. So I started asking questions like, well, why are African-American adolescents engaging in sexual risk? Because at the time, I heard most of, most of the, the research that I read had to do with the risk related to a, being an African-American youth that they engaged in more risk, and I just wanted to learn more about that. So I started with doing a meta-analysis, and I'm not going to go into details on each of these studies, but I just want to kind of give an idea of my thought process starting in graduate school through postdoc as well as up to currently. And I decided to look at the relationship between risky sexual behavior and substance use because they were often linked not just in the popular literature, but also in the research literature. And what I found was that for the most part, there's a small to moderate um, relationship between <coughs> substance use and risky sexual behavior. So it's not, you know, a causal relationship. You know, it's related, but there are a number of other factors that influence the strength of that relationship. So then I wanted to learn, okay, well, what are some of those factors that might influence the strength of the relationship between risky sex and substance use? So then we... So I started working with a data set called the Mobile, the Mobile Youth Survey, and it's based in Mobile, Alabama, and it focused on the 13 most impoverished communities in that area. And we wanted to kind of build off of the findings from the meta-analysis. So we said, okay, well, does type of substance you have a differential relationship to certain types of sex, sexual behaviors? So would using marijuana be linked to more a, a decrease in condom use compared to a different type of drug? And we did find that there were some differential relationships uh, between sub certain types of substances and certain types of sexual behaviors. So from there, I wanted to know, well, does this depend on your age group within adolescence? And what are the predictors of the, the differences that we might find. So using that same data set, we looked at change and predictors of risky sexual behavior longitudinally. And then it's like, okay, well, now that we have all these predictors, are there the things about people individually, their temperament or personality characteristics that might make you more prone to engage in risk behavior? So I was trying to build, move towards really trying to get an understanding of this particular topic area and what we could do about it. So I finished my grad, so this was during my graduate work at um, Alabama. So then I started my postdoc here in North Carolina. So I started reading up about the STI and HIV rates in the state. So I saw that 37,000 people are currently living with HIV AIDS in the state. And nearly 7% are unaware of their infection. And 80% were men who reported having sex with men. And 53% were young men. So still in this adolescent age group. 62% of all people living with HIV were virally suppressed. So that leaves a sizable portion who are not virally suppressed. And then, you know, you combine that with people who aren't even aware of their infection. You have a, a lot of risk, especially within this adolescent age group. So uh, I did some research to see, okay, well, what are some of the barriers to care and viral suppression within this age group here in North Carolina? So some people talked about transportation. So not being able to get to the clinic to get treatment in the first place. Family support. So if you don't, if you don't have the support of family or people around you who are close in terms of accessing treatment or even feeling comfortable disclosing your status, you're less likely to be engaged in HIV care. 
social stigma related. So if, if you don't want anyone to know that you're infected, it's hard to go to an HIV specialist or an infectious disease doc to get your treatment. And then health insurance. So if you're so it it tended to be the issue for people who were right in the middle. So they weren't necessarily they didn't qualify for Ryan White and under other funding, but they did it they were working usually service level jobs and didn't have the insurance to afford their treatment. So then the question became when and how do we intervene to reduce HIV risk among African American youth in rural North Carolina? So I started working with Giselle Corby Smith, who at the time was wrapping up an intervention called Teach One, Reach One. And it was an HIV prevention program for parents and youth based in rural North Carolina. So it talked, it didn't just focus on HIV, but it also talked about teen dating, um, teen dating violence and other risk factors that could, in, that could increase adolescents' risk for HIV. And the, this community was selected specifically because they had among the highest rates of HIV and STIs um, in the state. So this project was a community-based participatory research project. So they had established this partnership and it's been going on for almost 12 years now and the community identified this as a as a starting point this is where they wanted to start the work um, with UNC they wanted to focus on getting adolescents education about HIV prevention because it wasn't happening in the school system so we started looking at factors to see what are the things that influence whether or not um, adolescents engage in condom use. So if you make a choice to have sex, are you using condoms? And then we looked at, at uh, what are some creative ways that we can educate the community about HIV prevention? So this spoken word project was another CBPR based project where it was combining edutainment. So and individuals in the community learned um, about spoken word and gave a presentation to the community overall. And it was really well attended and um, youth and adults participated in this program and um, the community decided to take on a piece of it afterwards. So one of the things that we found during the intervention is that a lot of parents just weren't talking to their kids about sex. And if they, and for those who did, there were certain things that they were okay talking about and things that they were not okay talking about. And we wanted to understand, well, what are the predictors of whether a caregiver discusses sex with their child? So whether, what are they focusing on reproductive and sexual health? So menstruation, things on that level, and sensitive sex topics like condom use and pregnancy prevention. This, the community that we worked in has very strong religious ties, and we wondered how much of that influences whether or not a caregiver will engage their youth in conversations about sex. Um, it really had a large um, impact. As a lot of people felt, a, a, a lot of caregivers felt uncomfortable talking with their children about sex and giving them every education in terms of condom use because they're not supposed to be having sex in the first place. And I'll talk more about this um, in the project that we completed in the community um, regarding sexual health promotion. So for Teach One, Reach One, we wanted to see if, like, if we if we were able to get the population that we needed. So this was a lay health advisory <coughs> model where we recruited adolescents and their caregivers and dyads. And they were they were taught different from different modules concerning HIV prevention and teen dating violence. And their role was to recruit others in their network up to three people and administer the intervention to them. So we had the that, so they were called the allies. So people, so that we had the LHAs, the adolescents and their caregivers, and the people that they recruited from their social networks called allies for this, this um, particular intervention. So we d were able to evaluate it to see um, what the effect of Teach One, Reach One was. And what we found, and one thing to note with Teach One, Reach One, or we call it TORO, 
adolescents were between 10 and 13. So some people question why we would start an HIV prevention um, program so early. And most of our youth had not engaged in sexual activity when they had started the intervention and even when they had completed it. But, the, but they decided to start at that age range because in the community, kids as young as 12 were pregnant and they, a lot of them reported starting sexual activity around 13 or 14. So it was really important for the community <laughs> members to start the intervention well before adolescents started engaging in sexual activity. So when you look at the effects of the intervention, and a lot of it had to do with whether if they engaged in intercourse, did they use condoms, um, looking at self-efficacy. So we saw more of the attitude changes, especially in caregivers, but there wasn't an effect in terms of sexual behavior changes, and that's because most of the youth still hadn't engaged in sexual activity. One interesting thing about this, so for the follow-up study that I'll talk about um, a little <laughs> later, we interviewed some, and some participants who had participated in TORO, and one of them, I, did, I had done this interview with her, and she, she said, you know, it was a really great program. I loved it. I learned a lot. I wasn't learning anything in school about this. And she herself was a teen parent. So she said, she said, obviously, it didn't work for me. And we talked a little bit more about that. And then I asked her, OK, so you have a daughter who's now eight or nine. Do you plan on talking to her about sex? She said, oh, no, like I, I don't want to encourage it. So I, you know, I brought this back to the team. And I was like, oh, we failed. We, that's not really we, the, it, it's, when you, the, it's back to that, that ideology or that thought process that if you talk about um, sex, you're encouraging or you're putting a question in a youth's mind that wasn't there before. So from that work, from the graduate work up into postdoc, um, I really started kind of thinking about what types of things I wanted to focus on. And these are the questions that primarily drive the work that I'm doing now. So the first one has to do with how do individual social and structural factors interact to influence adolescent progression along the HIV care cascade. So I'm very much interested in HIV prevention, but especially in intervention. And that comes through when I talk about the work that we're doing in South Africa. Also interested in social structural determinants of health and when looking to see how that interacts to shape or exacerbate disease clustering within specific community or cultural context. And that gets into the interest in syndemics. The other has to do with how do you effectively mobilize members of key populations to address syndemics in their own communities? So it's really nice and well for researchers like us to come into communities and share our knowledge and develop these interventions. But how do you empower communities to be a part of that process, to come up with strategies or suggestions of their own? Because for the most part, community members, they are the experts of their own issues. And a lot of times, we don't even ask them with they think. We don't ask them what they think would influence a particular topic in their, a, a particular issue in their community. And then looking at the role of resiliency, spirituality, and agency in chronic disease management. So I, from the Teach One, Reach One, or Toro project, I had a small project um, that came after that. Um, that was looking at sexual health promotion among African-American youth in rural North Carolina. So the primary aim of this study was to look at the acceptability of youth adult partnerships or coalitions to address issues impacting African-American youth in those communities. So we wanted to see, well, we we did this we did teach one breach one among youth 10 to 13 let's kind of follow up to see what this what because this had happened um the, the project teach one reach one was near the end when i was starting my project so at that point they were focusing on data analysis and things like that so i wanted to see within such a strong religious context 
could we talk about sexual health promotion among adolescents here? And would communities members be willing to work together with youth to address problems in their own communities? So the questions that, that I focus on for this presentation, um, the first one had to do with tell me what relations are like between youth and adults in this community. So there has to be some type of perception probably on the positive level, or at least a desire to want to partner. So we wanted to see, okay, well, what do, what do these two groups think of each other? And then the other was, tell me about your thoughts about youth adult partnerships. So we explained what that meant. So after they, so that we, first we asked them, what do you think they are? We gave them an idea of what it meant. And then we asked them about their thoughts in terms of having such a partnership in their community. What would make that difficult? What would make it easier to do that there? So it was a participatory study that we conducted in two phases. So the first phase was kind of formative, qualitative work. So we interviewed 12 youth and 12 adults um, from the community. And then we conducted four focus groups, two youth and two adult focus groups, to get a real understanding of the thoughts around sexual health promotion, as well as the specifics around youth adult partnerships. And then we did a survey that really kind of built off, build, build off the information that we learned from the interviews with 150 adolescents from the community. And they were between 14 and 19. All the participants were conveniently recruited, so I worked with community partners, Project Momentum, and um, community enrichment organization to recruit adolescents. Um, they really kind of, they were pretty experienced in recruiting in the community, so they really took over that process. Adult participants or stakeholders, we selected people or we for the interviews that had connections with youth in the community. So that could either be teachers, parents, school board members, youth programs, pastors, um, and for youth, that was open. And then, so we focused only on the preliminary qualitative data for this presentation. We're still in the process of analyzing this data and as well as the survey data. So I'm just gonna pull some things that kind of stood out to us um, from this project. So the first thing we, one of the questions we asked them is, what is sexual health promotion among adolescents? And this responses were variable, and uh, not necessarily what we expected in some cases, but several other participants mentioned things like encouraging, uh, sexual health promotion means encouraging you to engage in safe sex should they decide to have sex. Um, another person said, promoting sex among youth, you're saying that it's okay for them to have sex. And adopting behaviors and attitudes support, supportive of caring for one's body. So we asked this question because we really wanted to get an idea or think about the type of language that we use in the community. Would we go into communities saying, we want to promote sexual health? Because if you do that, you have to be aware of how people perceive sexual health, or especially the promotion of that. So if we, we say we would like to do a project that's promoting sexual health, and you believe that we're going to be encouraging your 13-year-old to have sex and just do it safely, you're probably not going to want to have anything to do with the intervention. So that was one of the reasons why we asked that question. The other one had to do with, tell me about the types of interactions that unrelated youth and adults have in this community. So some people responded that adults show little interest in unrelated youth despite youth's desire to connect. So one youth said that they want the issues to stop, but they don't want to do anything. Um, adults often connected, adults were often connected with deviancy training. So several other youth said, well, I don't know about this youth adult partnership thing because some of the drug deals in the community are adults. So they're concerned about whether or not you should be encouraging this type of relationship. Some of the caregivers said this as well. <laughs> adults had a tendency to perceive youth as disinterested in engaging with adults to address con um, concerns among and for youth in the community. So on one hand, we had the adult saying, we would really like to be a part of something like this, but I don't think any youth would be interested in it. They think they know everything. They don't really want to connect with us. They think we're out of touch. Now, on the other hand, we had youth saying almost unanimously, well, we really would like to work with adults in this community, but most of them talk a lot, but they don't do anything. So they're not really interested in partnering with us. Um, 
The next thing we had, so this was, then we kind of transitioned to asking about the acceptability of youth adult partnerships to address challenges with this, within this community. And most of them said, you know, I think it's a really great idea. I just don't know that it would work here. And that had a lot to do with their perceptions of adults being disinterested and then adults thinking youth were disinterested. But all, everyone that we talked with were interested in, um, in taking part in it. But we asked them early on in the interview to say, okay, I think they said this would, this would be a good program here, but then we asked, well, would you participate in this type of program? And most people said yes, but there were several who said, you know what, my primary responsibility is to take care of my children. I don't really have the time to engage with a whole bunch of other kids. So we were asking really about, a lot about personal responsibility <coughs> for addressing challenges within the community. Most people were very open to that idea, though some people were just kind of feeling overwhelmed with the challenges that they had mentioned early on and didn't really feel that they had a role personally. personally. So our next steps with this particular project um, have to do, so we're going to conduct a, a community research dissemination event. Um, so we'll present the results of the sexual health promotion project introduce the idea of youth adult partnerships to a broader audience and really try to get feedback regarding whether or not this would be something of interest to the community and whether what type of intervention they would be interested in. From the data that we gathered, it seemed like people are kind of tired of hearing about HIV over and over again. And they talked about the, the other issues that youth had in the community and said, you know, we really think we need something more holistic here. Our youth need life skills, they need, to, they need entrepreneurship skills. So they listed a whole bunch of different things that they felt were, were missing in the community. So our thought is that any type of intervention that we might move forward with would have to be something more holistic. And another thing we'd like to do with the consortia that we already have is um, start a, a youth advisory cab. So as I mentioned before, the community that we work with, uh, the University Community Partnership is, is about 12 years old, but at this stage, they're all adults. We really don't have a youth voice. So what we'd like to do is develop a youth, a, a youth cab um, and really just kind of hear their voice in terms of what they would like to see in their communities um, and involve them in the process of developing intervention. So I, so after I completed, so actually during my postdoc at UNC, I had the opportunity to <coughs> complete an HIV prevention trials network um, fellowship. And I was able to work with Audrey Pettifor at UNC to look at, um, so at the time she was doing an HIV cash transfers intervention in rural South Africa. So as a scholar, I was able to work on some of the data for that project. And it really kind of awakened a sense in me of wanting to be involved in um, more work in South Africa. So I completed a Fogarty Fellowship during my first year on faculty at um, the Medical University of South Carolina. And the part of my fellowship, we did a uh, study called Social Structural Determinants of Adolescent Engagement in HIV Care. So my primary interest has always been with adolescents living with HIV. I started out working with them from a clinical perspective and continued doing that through graduate school and internship during psychology but had never had the opportunity to work with them from a research perspective. So this was really a great opportunity to do that. So AIDS-related illnesses are among the leading causes of death for youth worldwide, and 80% of them reside in Sub-Saharan Africa. We know that HIV-positive youth who aren't linked to and engaged in care contribute disproportionately to ongoing HIV transmissions. And we hear a lot about um, treatment as prevention, but that really is so treatment as prevention. If you're able to um, get people on antiretroviral treatment and get them virally suppressed, then transmissions go down dramatically. And that is true, but 
we have to be able to get you to a point where they're actually engaged in treatment. And for many places, especially in the area that we work, less than 20% are actually virally suppressed. So the point of this particular project, we really wanted to identify some of the determinants that interfere with adolescents engaging in treatment. So for them engaging, being retained, and adhering to their treatment. So there really have been few interventions that have been successful in South Africa, and I'm working specifically in the Western Cape, uh, that have been able to engage and retain HIV positive youth in treatment long term. One of the major issues that we have is the transition from pediatric to adult care. So in the clinic that we worked in, the transition happened at the age of 13. So just imagine that a 13 year old would be moving to an adult setting, which is very different from pediatric HIV care. And that was the treatment model until they saw that over time, we were, we were losing adolescents between 14 and they would come back when they were around 24. And at that point, you know, if they, if they, if they, were, if they were lived, their disease was very much advanced and they were on to second and third line treatment. Uh, pill fatigue is a huge issue. So adolescents just get tired of taking pills. You know, they, and it's, it's something that we, we don't really have a lot of solutions to. We don't have interventions to help them with pill fatigue, but this is something that we heard over and over again. I'm just tired of taking pills. And then adolescence, this is a complicated developmental period. Um, they're going through a lot of changes socially as well. So have, also managing a chronic disease is difficult during this time. And another huge issue had to do with stigma. So right now, most of the clinics are still separated. You have the HIV clinic, which is a specialty clinic in a lot of parts of the country. And you don't necessarily want to be seen going into an HIV clinic. And they also don't want to be mixed with adults. So most of the youth in our clinic have been perinatally infected. So they're used to the, a, a cohort of youth um, and haven't been in, and for the pediatric clinic, it's not necessarily separate, but they have different days where they, are, where they go for treatment. Adolescents who have transi transitioned to adult services talk about the stigma that they face from staff as well as from other patients where they assume that they, are, they have HIV because they were fast or engaging in sexual risk behaviors, not knowing that they were perinatally infected. So they would often say, well, they don't know my story. They don't know me, but still they judge me. So that feeling of judgment really kind of kept a lot of youth from going to the adult clinic. So our work focuses on Google A2, which is a, a township just outside of Cape Town. Um, and we also see uh, participants in Masi. So I just wanted to kind of show you, give you an idea of what the area looks like. But we are focusing for um, the next phase on Google A2 specifically. So the study that we did um, we were trying to identify key social determinants, um, intervention targets, and strategies to facilitate adolescent retention in HIV care and treatment adherence. So we started with some formative work. So we, um, inter we interviewed adult community stakeholders and adolescents living with HIV and their caregivers. So we're still actively analyzing this data, so I just wanted to kind of just present some of the things that have come up pretty strongly in our interviews. Uh, again, the issues concerning stigma that I already mentioned. Um, social support. So I, for those of you who are at the CFAR retreat, I talked all about um, social support from a family perspective. And one of the issues that we see pretty strongly is that as adolescents get older, their parents start to pull back. 
and they start to say, you know, I've done this for you so long, now it's your turn to take over. And what often happens is adolescents start to get overwhelmed and they stop taking their pills. So social support, especially identifying the type of social support that you receive from, whether it's caregivers or others in your social networks, is really important. Poor clinic experiences. So that was a huge issue. So adolescents often talked about services really being unfriendly. So there has been a huge initiative in, the, in Cape Town and probably other places in South Africa to talk about developing adolescent-friendly services. So when I say unfriendly, youth were talking about nurses shouting at them, um, just humiliation tactics, uh, very long lines. So our youth would say that they would come to the clinic at 8 o'clock in the morning and they wouldn't leave until 4 in the afternoon, which means so when you have to go to the clinic to get your treatment um, every two to three months, you're missing school and it starts to raise questions and you know, people at school start asking, well, why are you missing so much school? And that really provokes a lot of anxiety in adolescents to try to come up with reasons of why they're missing school so often. Mental health, often unaddressed. We found that there was, there was one social worker, um, one psychologist for four or five clinics in the area. So thinking about the caseload. So most adolescents um, who are reporting symptoms of depression, anxiety are not being treated. Uh, complexity of the treatment regimen. So for those on second line, third line treatment, if you're taking seven pills or more a day, it's really difficult to, to just be motivated to do that. And a lot of times we find that as the pill burden increases, adolescents don't, they're, they're retreating, they're not adhering to treatment as much. Transportation. So for most of the youth in this community, they receive services at the local clinic. But for those who don't want to be seen going into an HIV clinic, they might receive services in town or request to be transferred somewhere else. And that, and that means that now you need transportation to get back and forth to this clinic. And that's a challenge for a lot of youth. Also, um, with concerns regarding sexual violence, a lot of young women don't go to the clinic on their own. So they have to take taxis over, and that's a cost that's not covered by the clinic. Food insecurity, um, if you don't have food to eat, it's very difficult to focus on taking your treatment, which is what several of the youth had said. And then um, HIV status acceptance. So. Given that most of our youth were perinatally infected, they, they had been on treatment since they were children. And most of them didn't, they, they didn't find out why they were taking pills daily until they're around 10 to 11 years old. So they have gone through a period where they haven't really felt sick. So for a lot of them, they don't necessarily believe that if they stop taking their treatment that they will get sick. And we have a lot of youth who kind of cycle in and out. They'll, they'll kind of test themselves to see how far, how long they could go without taking treatment. And um, our clinician there would say often they're requesting pill holidays, so a period of time where they don't have to take treatment. And um, she's really discouraged that because, you know, once you stop the treatment, it, it's really not in their best interest. And, a lot, most of the time their viral loads just start to elevate. So from this project, uh, working on a few grants, so I have three grants listed there because I'm working on all three of them, but um, presenting pieces from the three, four, there are three separate grants, but I'm just presenting all of them because they are related. So the focus is to advance knowledge on the role of adolescents' personal networks in the retention in HIV care and to develop a network-based intervention. So the project that I have going on in Cape Town now is a social network 
a social network inventory. So we completed the qualitative data, which was phase one. We learned a lot from it. So the next, and one of the things that came out pretty clearly was the importance of social support. But we don't really know a lot about youth social networks or who are in their networks. Are there other adolescents with HIV who are in their networks? And how does that influence their retention and care and their treatment adherence? So those are the types of questions that we're asking through the social network assessment now. Um, and we're also collecting <clears throat> clinic data as well as some survey data to just really get a full picture of the degree of social support youth have and what their social networks, their personal networks look like. And so from that, we'd like to develop a social network intervention. So similar to the youth in um, rural North Carolina, a lot of them said, you know, we're just tired of hearing about HIV all the time. We have other needs, we have other interests. What could you do for us in areas that are important to us? So we really like to take a participatory approach to intervention and development with adolescents living with HIV. So for the next phase for intervention development, we'd like to hear from them, uh, from stakeholders who work with adolescents living with HIV. What do you think would be helpful in terms of increasing adolescent retention and treatment and increasing their adherence. So we like to do that through crowdsourcing or creative contributory contests or a challenge contest. And I'll talk more about what that is on the next slide. And then the third aim, or this is for the K, would be to pilot this intervention. So crowdsourcing is a process in which organizations partner with a virtual target community. It doesn't have to be a, a virtual community in um, low in income or middle income settings. Sometimes you can gather this information face to face, but it often involves some type of contest where you propose a question to an open audience. And for in this case, we're asking, what, what are some strategies that could help adolescents living with HIV to be retained in care? What could help them to take their treatment? Um, we like to focus on adolescents living with HIV, um, but we, it's open to anyone. So anyone could contribute their thoughts and ideas of, about potential interventions. So this is just kind of um, uh, an idea of what that what that contest might look like. So we start with our crowd, which would be adolescents and stakeholders. They're able to contribute hundreds of, of ideas. So this could be submitted online. It could be submitted to research assistants in person. And then the submissions are evaluated by adolescents and um, stakeholders for it. It would be a, a judge panel. And then the final idea is implemented. We also talked about using crowdsourcing um, as a way to engage one's personal networks from a social media perspective. So this would be where, as part of the intervention, adolescents would create educational materials. And those would be very short videos that they could disseminate online. And the idea would be that they could get their social network members to vote for their videos. And by that, you, you're not only educating the network, but also kind of reinforcing what adolescents say is important to them. So they, they want these types of edutainment type interventions. So this was our thought about um, doing something like that. So in terms of the intervention itself, again, this would be developed in a participatory way. But the idea would be, so one of the things we know is that a, a large number of our youth are not disclosed to people in their social <coughs> networks. So for some of them, their caregiver has passed away. They're on their own. So, other, so you might find that people, even within their household, might not know that they're living with HIV, which is a big challenge for a lot of them as they're not. They're, it's more difficult if you have people in your household who don't know your status to maintain your treatment. So we, we wanted to really uh, include adolescents who are also not disclosed to their, um, their networks. And by doing that, we would have disclosure counseling specifically for them. This is just an idea at this point. Um, 
what we talked about doing initially was a non-HIV, HIV intervention. Um, so the intervention itself would be more empowerment based, something that would be engaging not only to adolescents living with HIV, but other adolescents in the community. And there would be different sessions where it's more person-centered. So if there are specific areas that you'd like to have more training in, you could select that. So it's a, a menu. But for adolescents living with HIV, they would have a specific set of sessions that focus on treatment retention and adherence in addition to other things that they're able to take. Uh, this is, again, it's just an idea at this point. Um, and it would be great to kind of get your thoughts on that as well as we're, we're interested in hearing what adolescents think about it. This is my last slide. So it's just kind of a summary of uh, some of the, the topics that I'm interested in, um, some projects that are ongoing that kind of focus on um, HIV treatment, retention, adherence, as well as other areas. I won't go into detail about it, but just wanted to put it up there in case any of you all are also interested in similar topics. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. Hi, Jenny. Thanks for um, a nice talk. Can you talk a little bit about gender issues in your work and um, sort of thinking about sort of gender dynamics? Oftentimes you talked about kind of youth perspectives as monolithic, but what about sort of um, gender differences in youth perspective, experience, engagement with um, sexual health promotion? So most of it, so it's pretty imbalanced in terms of um, adolescents living with HIV. Is that the project you're talking about? So young, young girls and women are three times more likely to be infected than men, so they're a smaller group. Um, but it, it's something that we're exploring now and the data that we're collecting. So we didn't really ask much about um, that in previous studies. So if we look at the, a lot of the programs at the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation, which is our partner in Cape Town, focus on female empowerment, female HIV prevention, because of the, the disproportionate impact that it has on young women and girls. But in this program, we're including boys and girls, so adolescent boys and girls, just to get more of that perspective. But I know that you're working in the area. Did you have specific? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the, you know, the data from South Africa shows that sexual initiation is oftentimes very, you know, imbalanced, often forced. A lot of women sort of, for young women's first sexual initiation is, um, is not sort of a willful choice. So I, you know, and it also makes me think about your work in rural North Carolina, and I was wondering how sort of the work around sort of sexual promotion, you know, sexual health promotion, how you dealt with gender in those settings as well and working with both young men and young women. Yeah, so in rural North Carolina, especially when we were doing the Teach One, Reach One project, the parents tended to be more open to discussing uh, sexual sensitive topics with boys than they were with young girls in the family. So, and this is not surprising. So it's not surprising that, uh, the, and what a lot of caregivers said is that, you know, the burden of uh, initiating sex earlier falls on girls and young women. And they were mostly saying that because of pregnancy, they, they would say, well, a boy could walk away. But once you have this child, you're stuck. So there seemed to be more of a protective, um, parents seem to be more protective of their young girls than boys. But for the Teach One Reach One project, they all got the same information. And the, for the parent education proportion of it, or components of it, was really trying to get at that, that, um, that separatism that a lot of caregivers have.
So um, in both the U.S. and the South Africa example, you're, you're, you're doing a lot of formative work and developing new interventions. And I wanted to know if you'd done a review of evidence-based interventions that just haven't been um, adequately implemented or scaled up, or if you felt like there really was a, a gap that necessitated a new intervention to really reach these adolescents? So for rural North Carolina, where we are, so for, there are a number of these holistic interventions that have been successful in different parts of the country. So we're definitely not trying to create something from scratch there. And what they did with Teach One, Reach One is they presented a, no a number of different um, when they were developing this project, they presented a number of different evidence-based interventions and let the community select uh, components that were of interest to them. Because the, some of the ones, a lot of the ones that they saw, they said, oh, this wouldn't work here, we don't like this, but we need that. So they were adapted. For um, retention and adherence in South Africa, we really just haven't seen them yet. But th that doesn't mean that there aren't some out there, and when this um, the KO8 was reviewed, some of the reviewers mentioned, well, why don't you look at closely related programs? They may not be uh, focused on social networks, and that's what I mean, there, there weren't social network-based interventions for adolescents. So for that, we're also, during the youth advisory, that meeting, we'll talk about different programs from other groups and to see like what would be of interest. Could we keep elements from some of them because they're not necessarily the network portion, but there have been a lot of things that we could use to, um, especially when it comes to adherence. Um, you gave a nice example of a mother who kind of was resistant to talking about sexuality with her daughter. And um, I wonder if you also encountered kind of more like community-based resistance to talking about sex and sexuality more broadly, kind of this idea that please reduce HIV, but don't talk about sex while you're doing it. Like, Yeah, and we, we had that from the adult focus groups. So when they all got together, it, there was, there were a lot of there, there was a lot of skepticism skepticism when it came to discussing sex with adolescents, especially if it's not abstinence-focused. Um, when you're talking about sexual health promotion, it's not necessarily abstinence-focused. It has to do with educating youth on methods, if, if they choose abstinence, but if, they, if not, have the, having them educated enough or have, make sure that they have the knowledge to protect themselves. That's a challenge. Um, we, we're still trying to see how we would work around that with adults. I can't say that we have a solution at this point. Youth were certainly open to it, but the question would be, would their parents be supportive of them participating in an intervention like that? <coughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Tierney.